Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 553. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden on the 25th of November, 2019. Harkin, if you hear out the window, that's the leaf blower guy. I don't have one, and Gavin doesn't have one, but George does. I'm at George's house this week, uh, uh, spending the second week of my vacation without George, who is in St. Bart's, but he lent us out the house, and we really appreciate that. Two of the friendliest cats uh, a, a clergy person could ever have, and we, we re- appreciate that, George, letting us stay here. How's the aisle life, George? Very nice. So uh, we've, uh, the, it's the start of the season. The yacht basin is full. The, the, I, I was told that the Americans come for Thanksgiving, the Russians come for New Year's, and then the English come in February. So we're getting different waves of tourists and, and villas and everything are filling up and it's quite exciting. It's, it's a lot. It's a very quiet island. There are no big hotels. The largest hotel has 14 rooms. Oh, wow. So it's uh, at, because the biggest plane that can land only holds about 18 people. But it's uh, but I can see there's a cruise ship coming into the harbor right now. So in about an hour, I'll get my the church will be packed with uh, elderly Americans uh, with fanny packs and cameras taking pictures of a plain white West Indian church because there's nothing else to do until the cafe is <laughs> open. Well, I walked with my fanny pack all the way through Disney Magic Kingdom. And we went to Universal Studios and we did Epcot Center uh, all three days uh, of uh, three uh, wonderful 10 hour days of walking, uh, three of your wonderful parks here in Florida. I'm tired. Hey, Kevin, (laughs) you're you're in the only place in this hemisphere that is more expensive than St. Bart's. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Oh, we went in Orlando, gas was $2.18 a a gallon. (gasps) Wow. And I walk into your Walmart super center here and they had uh, two liters of soda pop for our northern northern viewers for a dollar eighteen. Just try to buy hamburger and french fries in Disney World. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's very much different. And how are the aisles over where you are, jo- uh, Gavin? Well, they're very exciting. We're limbering up for this general election then. And either we're being lulled into a sense of false security or else Boris is going to win. But um, uh, we, we're all walking on eggshells here, waiting waiting for the disaster <laughs> that may simply turn everything around. But we're having, we're having a very exciting time, really. The ramifications of Prince Andrew's suicidal interview continue in the press. And, uh, and they don't stop, partly because um, there's a television program called The Crown, which has got into the 1960s. Actually, it's it's a really unpleasant presentation of the royal family, uh, written by a man who says he really doesn't like them and um, and, and attributes motives to them of a poisonous kind. It sure, really, yeah. um, really makes them unpleasant. I, I, uh, we began to watch it last night, and I said halfway through to my wife, actually, I'm I'm finding this so... I think toxic is the only word. You know, let's just please turn it off, because... It's um, so th- that's a that's a background. It's on Netflix at the moment. It's just come out. People are watching The Crown, and at the same time, Andrew, whom Fergie, who is the least intellectually well endowed member of the royal family, described as not very fast on his feet. I mean, <laughs> imagine being called thick by Thur- by Fergie. Uh, <laughs> Andrew's kamikaze interview continues to unravel uh, to the amusement of a lot of people. But the problem is that that they have to firewall him quickly so he's been thrown out by the queen uh he's he's defenestrated from the royal family Meghan markle is leading the moral charge against him um which Meghan and her team uh, i i suddenly the other day i i, I thought I, I can see the future what's going to happen is when the queen dies we'll have a referendum on which member of the royal yeah, family we want right. to succeed yeah. uh, because it'll have to have public support and Charles doesn't quite have enough and Meghan and her team will win and Meghan will become the new Queen of England with her team and presumably Harry is somewhere in the background and I, I think this is the future and you heard it first on Anglican Unscripted. Well here in America we always hear uh, 
about once a decade the strife of the monarchy. The monarchy will never survive the divorce of Charles and Di. Do 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 do. News at ten. The monarchy will never survive the death of uh, Princess Di. You know, and and the queen doesn't help herself with the way she's uh, uh, making public statements about the the death of Princess Di. And so every decade or so, we're we're under the impression here in America that it's over with. Is the uh, the monarchy over with again? Um. No, but the stakes are getting higher. I mean, I mean, basically, the the fox is getting cannier and the chicken is leaping higher. So, so the, uh, the 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 politically correct fox is certainly on the monarchy's tail, and that's why they threw Andrew out almost instantaneously, much to his huge surprise. Uh, but we're being reconfigured. This, as I think we'll talk about later on in the show, this public death by association is in impossible to avoid and so it just could be that um there's too much association for the monarchy to easily survive in its present form but i agree we're always saying that it's just it's getting more serious well, but i guess that our first story uh this week is uh, gafcon has established beachhead in ireland uh george you want to hit us with that story well the uh harold miller the bishop of down and Dromore which is essentially Belfast and the surrounding areas, mm -hmm. retired. And a new, and a new and the archdeacon there, uh, David McClay, was elected bishop. Now, McClay is a member of the GAFCON Ireland uh, organizing or steering group. He's been to the uh, GAFCON meetings. Kevin, I think you and I were sure. introduced to him, along with 100 other people. <laughs> uh, so I don't have a very clear picture. But... He is a solid evangelical Northern Irishman. Well, after the election, we had an unprecedented thing happen. Southern Irish clergy, liberal clergy, began a campaign to try to convince the bishops to refuse to accept the election. They lobbied privately, uh, their supporters in the House of Bishops, and then they took the extraordinary step of basically in collusion with the Irish Times, the religion reporter there is no friend of the Anglican world, and of li he's a liberal, uh, and they had an article about how horrible Gafcon is, the Irish Times, and published alongside it was a letter saying that the new bishop is homophobic and Gafcon hates women, it's misogynist, doesn't want women to be priests, um, or bishops, and just all of these over-the-top uh, claims and exaggerations that being a member of GAFCON is un-Anglican. It contradicts the tenets of the Church of Ireland. And, well, on Wednesday of this week, the Irish bishops met, and they confirmed the Bishop of Down and Dromore, David McClay, as bishop, and there were two letters published that same day. One in defense of GAFCON by the chairman of GAFCON Ireland, Timothy Anderson, which we reposted on Anglican Inc., which basically took point by point all these nasty little things and said they're blatantly untrue. In fact, GAFCON is the best of Anglicanism, and here's why. Mm -hmm. But there was a second letter that I did not really bother to read because I saw the signature. And it was by the first gay dean in Ireland. He's in the South. Uh, Laughlin, Laughlin, Layton, I, name escapes yeah. me. And he wrote a letter saying, and I, a friend of mine said, you really should read this letter. And I read it, and the Irish and the Irish liberal was saying to his fellow liberals, look, fellas, we've lost the game. The Church of Ireland is now firmly in the hands of the conservative evangelicals, and if we're going to survive, we need to make nice. And this public attempt to shame and humiliate and cast uh, mud at this new bishop is only going to backfire and result in our being further marginalized. So he here's the thing, one of, if you will, the Gene Robinson of Ireland mm. has basically said to his fellow liberals and uh, members of the pro-gay wing of the Church of Ireland, we've lost, we've lost guys. We need to go along to get along to preserve what we've achieved so far. Now, Gavin, is it this easy to retake Ireland? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> well, um, no, I mean, Ireland has been one of the most rapidly secularized very secular. countries yeah. in Europe. Um, 
I, I think, th I mean, the letter from the dean is, is right. Essentially, both parts of the church, the liberal and the conservative, are under enormous pressure, but for very different reasons. Uh, so uh, as George reported on behalf of this man, most of the sensible liberals know they have no second generation. Uh, their attempts to appease society haven't produced any Christians. I mean, they've gained them a few plaudits, a bit of a few pats on the shoulder. You know, if we were going to do religion, it might be like yours, but we're not, so never mind. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the conservatives who are risking death by association. Uh, so, no, both parts of Christianity are in really a serious trouble, but of course it's our analysis that there is no future at all in the progressive placating of secular society. The only future can possibly be in being faithful to Jesus and the gospel, but that's going to bring us into increasingly, increasingly intense confrontation with the zeitgeist, as I think we're going to find from some of the stories that we're going to be dealing with, with today. Uh, Justin well, Welby and abortion clinics, uh, uh, Catholic chaplaincies and, uh, and, and, and student pro-choice movements. Wherever we look, we're having a very serious confrontation between the, the gospel and the zeitgeist. Well, Justin Welby gave a, a Love Your Mortal Enemy interview. Yes, Gavin, he, he was he not, Justin Welby was at, at uh, Christ Church in Dublin to mark the 150th anniversary of disestablishment. And he was asked some questions that made the newspapers and he characterized GAFCON in just essentially the same way as the Southern Irish liberals did. Well, he, he, he was asked what his attitude to GAFCON was and I thought rather clumsily said, the New Testament tells me to love my enemies. Um, so, um, but of course they're not my enemies, he quickly said, having realized he was <laughs> going to put, why should my fellow Christians be my enemies? And, but if they were, I would love them. <laughs> I mean, he went round in circles. The, the, I'm really sorry, we're, we're not the Justin Welby Appreciation Society, but the things he said about Europe were superficial in the extreme. And he, 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 he so poorly disguised his dislike of GAFCON, calling it once more, a, 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 you know, where it acts as a ginger group, he patted it on the head, it's okay. And, uh, but, but essentially he realizes that, that he faces the danger of schism and doesn't, again, he doesn't know which way to go. If he goes against GAFCON, he's quite rightly accused of turning his back on Orthodox Christianity, which he's terrified to do for reasons of support within the church. And if he goes, well, he can't go for Gafcon because he doesn't believe in it. So he's a bit stuck, and it and it looked like it. It's very sad, and I'm I'm really sorry for him. It's it, it doesn't help him. It doesn't help Gafcon. It doesn't help the church. It's um, it's a poor situation. Uh, last week we sat down at about nine ten a.m. and we recorded a show where we praised Chick Fil A. I think it was Gavin who said something marvelously wonderful about how it is to have a Christian organization, Christian company, uh, doing what Chick-fil-A does. At 11 a.m., right after I click the publish button and our episode goes out to the world, Chick-fil-A uh, issues a update on who they're going to give money to next year in 2020. And organizations like the Salvation Army and Christian Athletes and uh, the, the same people they've given to for a dozen years are no longer on the list. They've included on their list, I'm going to say pro-LGTBQIZY um, organizations, but I'll have George update us on who they are. And our whole story last week was shot. No, it, actually, it wasn't. It wasn't okay. shot at all, Gavin. Okay, uh, Kevin. Kevin, you, sorry, I'm I'm Kevin this week. The story was that the market sorts these things out. It does. And Chick Fil A's success had been by being countercultural, and by taking an aggressively Christian stand in the marketplace, refusing to open on Sundays, even when they're in a mall and all the mall contracts say you must do business on Sunday. They refused to because they will not trade on Sunday and. So the, so the point was the market will sort these things out. Look what happened to Procter & Gamble. They lost $8 billion when they decided to go woke with their shaving products oh, and be anti-masculine. <laughs> yeah. And now we're going to see if that is going to work because the, the, the afternoon that we talk, praised the market and praised Chick-fil-A as being an example, its financial arm, its foundation, the Chick-fil-A Foundation said, 
and here's the thing it broadcasts this information it just didn't do it in the dark of night and the fellowship of christian Ash athletes and the salvation army found out at the end of the year they're not grants are not being renewed they went out of their way to aggressively state we're changing our focus we're going to give it to groups like covenant house now some of you with memories may remember covenant house was founded by a catholic priest named bruce ritter and it was a catholic charity for some a while then Bruce Ritter began and as for homeless youth in New York City and so on. Now, Covenant House had a major scandal where Bruce Ritter was fiddling with the little boys who were runaways and the little girls. And the Catholic Church cut its relations off. And Covenant House basically has become an, a pro-gay organization. They'll drive teens to abortion clinics. They, they're out there. They're not, what they, they're not a Catholic entity as they once were in the 80s they get chick-fil-a is giving money to these groups now here's the thing franklin graham the the noted uh leader of the conservative christian world talk, got on the phone and talked to dan Cathy. dan is the is the chairman of chick-fil-a the son of its founder and franklin graham said what are you guys up to and dan Cathy said we've changed nothing We've just sort of, you know, our mission is the same. We're still open. We're still closed on Sundays. We still work by Christian principles. We're just redirecting some of our funds in a new attempt to reach a broader market. Unfortunately for Dan Cathy, at the same time he was talking to Franklin Graham, the chief operating officer gave an interview to an LGBT outlet that basically said, yes, we're dumping the Christian stuff and we're really going full fledged into being a good corporate citizen so that gay people like us. Now, why did they do this? Well, they're trying to open 15 stores in Toronto. They recently tried to open a store in the UK and gay activists shut down the store in the UK and have <clears throat> been basically giving them hell in Toronto. So Chick-fil-A's, I think maybe second tier of management has said, well, if we appease the gay lobby, and we keep the boss upstairs happy by being closed on Sunday, we can have it both ways. Well, and, and Robert Gagnon, who is a friend of this show, is a professor at a seminary in Houston, longtime professor at Princeton at Presbyterian Seminary in Pittsburgh, a New Testament scholar, um, basically said, uh, had, an, had a piece in the Federalist this morning saying that, uh, look, if you're an evangelical or a fundamentalist, or if you're a Christian who went out of your way to support this organization in the past, walk away now. Yeah, I used to drive out of the way. Yeah. I used to drive 20 minutes to get my Chick-fil-A, or 25 minutes. And they, I don't think Chick-fil-A understands because they didn't watch other businesses uh, do this wrong. You can't just give in to the LGTBs by changing a couple of your corporate structures. The only way... The Chick-fil-A can survive this and have full uh, adoption into the LGBTQ community is to only serve transgender chicken, only serve uh, lesbian and gay chickens uh, to the customer. That's the only uh, way you can uh, stop short of making this a colossal uh, mistake, in my humble opinion. Well, it, and, but as to overturning what our argument actually this is going to reinforce it because yeah. this is going to be a new coke episode remember yes, back in the 80s was it wasn't in the 80s or the yes 70s? it was the 80s it was 84 80s. 83 84 coca-cola said coca-cola got some new marketing execs in there saying we need to change our fuddy duddy attitude and let's just throw out the product that made us billions and come up with a new thing that new thing that our experts say tastes better well what happened man coke got <laughs> hammered and it it and they had to come back now coke was smart by basically uh apologizing apologizing mm -hmm. and saying look you people love it so much we're bringing it back and it actually survived the market challenge from being politically correct or stupid management decisions will chick will chick-fil-a survive this really dreadful management decision who knows? Well, the interesting thing about the Coke versus Pepsi at the time in the in the early '80s was Pepsi was slowly taking market share away from Coke, and Coke did such a bad job changing the new Coke. People said this must have been deliberate because when they came out at the end, Coke had regained all their market share within five years. Yeah. So they're like, it was so bad it had to be deliberate, 
Maybe this is so bad on Chick-fil-A's part, it has to be deliberate. But how else is Chick-fil-A going to get into uh, European markets, Gavin? Well, I've just been thinking the, the theology or the spirituality of this. Um, I, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think that, we, as we've said before, that Europe is quite as driven by capitalism uh, as America is, but partly because we just don't have that history of entrepreneurialism. But I was thinking it seems to me that... that you can that if you appeal to 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 the appetites of food and drink um then then you may um uh, there's some chance of people refusing food and drink but but if you appeal to sex people are likely just to 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 swallow it whole so i think it seems to me that it may not just the maybe a number of variables and one is which appetite of the lower nature do you go for because so far we don't seem to have shown any capacity to refuse anything to do with the sexualization of society. So um, it, it, it's how the variables stack up, really. Well, it's interesting because the in the Chick-fil-A's that uh, I visit in, in Connecticut, the gays and the lesbians go there. Um, they, they get their Chick-fil-A sandwiches, their fries, their uh, uh, lemonade or their uh, chocolate shake. And they don't complain. You know, the food is good. It, the The market was driven by the food in their minds, not by the agenda of Chick-fil-A. Well, it's a bit like the hip... Isn't this just hypocrisy? It's a bit like uh, one of our politicians here, a woman called Joe Swinson, who, who is our, our, our woke lady woman, uh, liberal Democrat leader. It turns out she has been making Greta Thunberg look like an amateur when it comes to ecological issues and it turns out that she never goes anywhere except by plane when they came to look at her expenses mm. so it could simply be that although uh, people pretend to be driven by principle in reality they reach for the most comfortable solution for their needs whatever they think they are it's this uh, the thing that they've accused Christians of all this time uh, a gap between practice and principle is actually universal. The difference, I think, is that Christians try and repent and improve, and I'm not sure as yet there's any evidence that secularists feel the same need unless they're caught out. Uh, George, last week we reported on the show about the falling numbers in Canada. Uh, did I see you posted an updated story on Anglican Inc. this week? Well, I posted a, sto a, a, a statement released by five uh, Toronto area clergy. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of whom is a friend of the show, E. from Radnor, who's sure. written, he's a professor at Wycliffe Seminary. And uh, the five, I think, include uh, two, two Wycliffe professors, a, a parish priest, an assistant, and a chaplain. I mean, it's sort of a cross-section. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, set out to be, here are the thousand people we have, but basically representative of a cross-section of types of clergy. And the, the Toronto letter basically says to the Anglican bishops of Canada, look, in 20 years, the church is gone. Your own statistics tell, your own de demographic state studies show us this. Why don't you just make life easier for the rest of us conservatives and give us delegated Episcopal pastoral oversight, depot as it was called in the United States, so that we are not drowned, we are not drug, we are not pulled underwater with the rest of the Anglican Church of Canada, which is hemorrhaging. There are evangelical parishes and even evangelical dioceses. The Arctic, for instance, is actually growing, uh, who are not uh, afflicted by the death spiral of secularism that is infecting the Anglican Church of Canada, as well as the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church and the United Church, the Presbyterian Church, all organized religion in Canada is going down the tubes uh, Catholicism in Quebec is once went from being the most Catholic place on earth. I think it's apart from Vatican City yeah. in the early 1960s. <laughs> it was. It is more secular than France is today, uh, Quebec. And the Anglican Church, and so the evangel the conservatives, evangelical, Anglo Catholic, some charismatics in left in the Anglican Church of Canada are saying, guys, just, you know, if we're going into hospice, just cut us a break right now and allow us to be our, do our own thing and not be dragged down with the rest of you. Well, my question is, why can't they just join Enoch? Property issues, okay. uh, 
uh, it, it, it's never a simple question because um, if you are a priest of a very successful growing church in the Toronto area where numbers are increasing, growth is increasing, do you really want to set aside half of your income for the next 10 years to fight lawsuits and not carry out the work of God? Or can you carry out the work of God and basically ignore the rest of the church? That's much easier and it's a much more efficient way to go forward. Well, I forget, does uh, Canada have a, a dentist clause? Yes. Okay. That's what happened at, at uh, That's the right, at church out in Vancouver. That's right. Uh, yeah. J.I. Packer, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Shaughnessy. All, I, yeah, you got it right. Um, that yeah. church went from, you know, 1,500 people. Uh, the uh, diocese uh, basically prevailed and got them kicked out. Hmm. Now it's a building that the 100 people who still go there can't afford to keep the heat on in the winter without diocesan subsidies. So the, uh, the, the legal system in Canada is just as stacked against the breakaway groups. Um, and you basically have to decide what is in the best interest in the short term. If it's all going to be over in 20 years anyway, you might as well uh, keep on keeping on and continue ignoring the kooks and nuts and the diocesan offices and in synod and just do daily work of the parish priest, which needs to be done season in and season out. I think George has just said some, put his fingers on, on something very important. Um, as we've watched over the last 30 years, biblical Anglican traditionalists try to work out how to deal with the onslaught they're facing, both from secular society, but more importantly, from within the secularized church. I think George is right. One of the one of the things that people have to take into account is what's the next 20 or 30 years going to be like? Are we going to turn society around or are we heading for a time of secular persecution with numbers not growing in the way we thought we were going to? In which case, let's not waste the energy, just as George has said, fighting the institution we belong to, fighting legal battles. Uh, let's live for the day and be faithful to Jesus and forget, forget all the strategy. I, I think that's a very wise thing and i haven't heard it said much before but i think george may have put his finger on one of the dynamics and one of the reasons why in the west the gafcon uh not experiment that's the wrong word but the the initiative at least certainly in the secularized parts of europe and maybe in the states is going to find it harder to work because people are just not going to want to use the energy they have and the money they have stepping out of line and facing attack on both fronts. Napoleon famously learned that you mustn't fight on two fronts, and I think that may be a lesson that conservative Christians have to face as well. Well, it's a, I, I saw that uh, Archbishop um, Foley Beach went to Pakistan, George. What was that on? Foley Beach was invited to Pakistan by uh, the uh, Azad Marshal, mm -hmm. the Bishop of Rye Wind, who's the president of the National Councils of Churches in Pakistan, and by Humphrey Peters, the moderator of the Church of Pakistan. Uh, they met at a meeting in Dubai of the Global South about a year ago, and the invitation was extended. And Foley Beach is coming both in his capacity as chairman of GAFCON and as archbishop of the ACNA. And this is quite a symbolic step in the sense that Pakistan, the Church of Pakistan, is not part of uh, the GAFCON movement though its sympathies lie with GAFCON, uh, theologically and in every other way. But for reasons, for the same reasons that a <laughs> evangelical parish in Toronto is not going to get in a fight with the diocese, the Church of Pakistan is not going to get in a fight with Canterbury because they're under siege by Islam, by, Islam, by the, the Pakistani government just nationalized some of their schools again, taking them away from the control of the church which provides both income and education for their students. So these Christian colleges now are going to be used to educate non-Christian students. Church of Pakistan needs someone who they think will be their advocate in the corridors of power. So they're basically keeping the finger in the uh, uh, Canterbury world. But it, I think, is an encouraging nonetheless that spiritually they seek to be affirmed and tied to the dynamo that is GAFCON and the ACNA. So you can be critical and say they're having it both ways, or you can be positive saying they know what they need to do now 
to survive another day. Well, they they want know to what they need spiritually, and they know what they need politically. They know they need the street cred that Canterbury offers, but they know that they can get the spiritual resources from Gafcon. <sighs> Irony. <laughs> it just it continues in our in our, our quest here. I wanted to to follow up. I don't think we ever really got an answer uh, talking about the monarchy. Uh, you've had some bad days over there in the last uh, uh, two weeks since the Prince Andrew uh, stories have continued. Um, it, it, does the monarchy survive something like this? I I, I want to avoid apocalypticism, but but um, <laughs> so let, 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 let's. Uh, there are two narratives. The one sure. level is it, it survives, it adapts. It's proved to be incredibly good at adapting. So all credit to it, but. I think the game changer is going to be when the, when the queen dies, there's going to be a number of voices raised up saying, we want a multi-faith monarchy. Uh, and so uh, the multi-faith will involve to some extent secularism, but most importantly, Islam. And then the question is whether the idea of monarchy, which is it's high Christianity. I mean, one of the theological rationales for the idea of monarchy is that the monarch is in a prophetic sense the lord's anointed and supreme has, has, protector of the church uh y yes as, as opposed to governor but but you're mm -hmm. right um a kind of pr protective and prophetic role mm -hmm. uh, which conflates el elements of the old testament the new and and the charismatic in in a in a mystical an anointing uh, and it, it is it, it is as sublimely and profoundly Christian as you could get. In fact, it's so sublimely Christian that most people have no idea uh, of the, the, the theology and the theory behind it. So what's going to happen when you take this profound, sublime Christian uh, um, uh, pattern for dealing with society and you attempt to Islamize it? Well, at one level, it'll be very easy. You just slip in bits of the Quran and you nod to Muhammad as well as to Jesus. And of course, the, lib the liberals will think thereby adding an extra strand and, en and enriching it enormously. But I think many Christians will say, actually, this is completely non-negotiable. Uh, you you're, you're either the you're either Yahweh's anointed or or you're Allah's mercenary. But the two don't overlap. Um, and and at that point, the danger is that a number of Christians may well withdraw their identification and support from a multi-faith monarchy. So it, part, it, 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 it can only, I think it can only take so many more crises. One of the things that people have been saying is instead of looking at this rich theology of the, of the anointed, prophetic and protective, uh, they're instead saying, well, really, they should be doing charity work. You know, the, the, the question for Andrew is he's not allowed to do any charity work, so there's no role left for him. So he wants to give his daughters, mafia-like, his charity work. And people are saying, no, no, monarchy and charity don't work like that. It's not something you pass down the family line to your not particularly uh, attractive, I don't, uh, socially attractive daughters. So there's, there's real confusion here, over here in terms of the categories of what we're dealing with. And monarchy appears to have become... Uh, a sort of large version of Father Christmas for every day of the year, dealing, handing out goodies to people who need them. Well, th that's not really enough to survive. Celebrities can do that. So I, I think we're facing the problem of a, of a, of a, a, Christ, a crisis for Christians, at least in terms of what the monarchy is for and how it works. Don't underestimate the Windsors. They've been extremely canny slightly after the event but they've caught up in time in the end but we'd live in interesting times oh we they, really do i mean in in sweden which has a, a monarchy this past year they basically slimmed it down the king has uh, a number of sons and daughters and essentially what they did was they uh only the heir and his wife and children are part of now the royal family sure. everybody else is just a relation, but they're not part of the team anymore. So that the, the, the Swedes have survived. Uh, Sweden, Church of Sweden was dis disestablished about 10 years ago. The monarchy, uh, Sweden is, is, is essentially a, a more of a laboratory of what we m may see happen uh, in the sense of uh, what's been done in similar circumstances. And what the Swedes have done has, in essence, tried to make the monarchy as inoffensive as possible, while at the same time making it as symbolic as possible, and cutting off the Andrews, the second and third sons, from and you know such that 
Meghan Markle, for instance, would not be part of the royal family if she was the wife of the second son in in in, in, in Sweden. Well, except so, that we we borrowed, she she wonderfully conflates the, the two versions of monarchy on both sides of the Atlantic. Your your monarchy is essentially uh, ac actors and celebrities and very rich people. So she's she has she's combined both. The um, you, you're quite right. You're quite right, George, saying that she she's going to be underqualified in terms of the slimming down of the European model, but she's overqualified when it comes to in, incorporating the American model in. And it's, it's entirely possible, I know this sounds slightly zany, but it's entirely possible if she doesn't screw up, which she probably will because she doesn't show the, the, the level of acumen required to survive at the highest level. But if she doesn't screw up, she could actually survive very well just on the basis of of the popularity that comes from celebrity figures. The trouble is you do have to be very well advised and, and quite bright. And, and I'm not sure she's well enough advised. Well, you have to play by the rules better than Princess Di did. And you have to be smarter than Princess Fergie. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> and, and you'll do just fine it, it, if memory serves correctly. And lucky, and lucky. <laughs> and lucky. Um, <laughs> It, it's fun to watch from overseas here in America, and I don't know uh, if the rest of our European and African audiences uh, understand just the complexity involved in, in keeping a moniker together. Uh, you have to keep all the uh, princes and princesses from doing bad things. And I see Prince Andrew here. Is he going to lose his HRH status, or has he lost it already? Or? Um, I, I, I doubt people are sufficiently... Um, lexicographically informed to want to take it away from him. Okay. What, what will happen is he'll he'll just be buried in, in the back of the royal family and invited to play golf every day and keep away from the cameras. And then the hope is nobody will hear from him anymore. And so long as he doesn't discover that there's any evidence of him uh, involved in trafficking women, uh, he may escape. But of course, people are on his trail in order to prove that... Um, that he was the recipient of trafficked favors. And if, I mean, if any of that mud sticks, well, the show ain't over yet. Well, it's not because at some point, some security guards are going to find a real good book deal and say, all right, I'm going to talk. But I, I, well, this is all speculation. We don't know what we're talking about. Uh, of course true. not. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. But my, my, my point being is, on the one hand, there have been... A, just as bad incidents of royal behavior when uh, Harry decided to go to a, as a young adult, decided to dress up as an SS officer and go to a costume party. That That's not the bad one. <laughs> no. no, but you know, here he is 15 years later, sure. sanitized. Time forgets that, and um, we don't know what the future will bring. And luckily for uh, uh, Andrew, if this Epstein scandal does finally blow up, there will be far more prominent people uh, who will be tainted and be part of the uh, uh, sexual scandal surrounding Epstein than Andrew will be second second tier, and he may and that they may survive because he is not as important as President this and Governor that and this important uh, celebrity. Um, he may be saved by his just being an, an English royalty yeah yeah I mean well, he, he, he's he not might, President Clinton you know he might be but but because the royal family are, are doing what the Episcopal Church and the Church of England are trying to do but with great much more finesse that is they're trying to placate public taste and be ahead of the curve and they're doing it much you know reason quite well um, but I think still what it, is, what it exemplifies is that we have a real spiritualized culture war. And as it gets more intense, the opportunities of straddling it or being agnostic are, are beginning to be removed. I was very impressed by the fact that the Catholic chaplain of Cardiff University said to his Catholic students, you can't hold office in the students' union anymore because it's come out as being so pro-choice. And he used the example, the analogy of the period when Catholics were refused public office in England until uh, until the 1860s or so. But but he's essentially taking the Christian war to to the to to society. And uh, you're going to have people on both sides saying, 
we no longer are compatible with each other. Christians have to come out, they have to be separate, uh, and they have to retreat. So the royal family are are, are pursuing the the accommodationist approach, uh, and a number of Christians, starting with Gafcon and moving on through the ecumenical spectrum, are beginning to notice that the only real uh, refuge is in intensifying their Christian integrity and paying whatever price is asked of them. Amen. Uh, I, what a great way to end the program. I agree with that wholeheartedly. There's, there is a high cost. Now, uh, we're not going to record on Friday because here in America we're having Thanksgiving and we're going to uh, slaughter millions of turkeys. We're going to peel billions of potatoes and we're going to eat lots of pumpkin pie. And then the next day is called Black Friday. And that's because uh, your credit card takes a hit if you're silly enough to go to the balls and shop for Christmas. Um, I guess what's the equivalent over in uh, Europe or England would be like uh, Boxing Day or something where you go out and you, you shop, shop, shop till you drop. And so uh, <laughs> we're taking expert. off until the final, uh, the next Monday when I return to Connecticut from holiday. And uh, I do want to bid everybody a happy Thanksgiving until then. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 553, while we examine the chicken entrails, or do something the equivalent of Anglican unscripted. Mm-hmm.